I think the minute I stepped on our practice field for rugby, the calling happened. Uh, an eight-year plan to be on the team, and I was in it within two years. Don't wait until you are a pro to be a pro, right? Like, I like doing something, look, stopping and learning from it. Like, it just looked like it was a heavy hit. It gets up, it's not up. You know, that's the first time I played, like, professionally. I'm making rugby money. How can I make money outside of it? And those two Scottish guys, and they said, oh, you're, um, you're here for the movie. Rugby is a sport where that's often coupled with actually having a good time. He looked at me and he says, you guys are awesome. Yo, what's up, everybody? Welcome to another great episode of Grow Rugby. My name is Gift Gift Timey Bailu, and this is the show where we speak with people about the opportunities that they have found, created, or taken advantage of via rugby. Hey, <laughs> I got to be honest with you. It is so cold out here today. It, it it is freezing. We got the full freezing frost. Like it feels like a Tim Burton movie outside in some cases, just because it's icicles everywhere, even on the blades of grass. And in Louisiana, we're not built for this. All right, we're not built for having all this coldness. So bear with me if I start to sh 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 shiver a little bit during this uh, this early little monologue here. But I, I just have to say, I am definitely not liking it at all. I hate it. No, no, I hate it. I hate it. I don't know how anybody lives in this. I had a, a, a friend on a, a Facebook group uh, refer to the fact that they were going to be sitting in negative 39, degree, 39 degrees Fahrenheit weather. I don't understand how that is. Right now, we're in, it's 22 degrees, so that's negative 2 degrees Celsius. So to get to negative 39 degrees, that's what, like negative, like negative, uh, 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 you know, 20? in celsius something to that effect like that's that's insane there's there's no reason for weather to get that cold there's no reason to be that happy in it i mean my friend gave me a good reason and and i respect you know get the monetary needs rugby life but still i can't do it so in, in what we're dealing with now uh you know it, it it sucks but you know give much consideration to the people who are in like texas and all these places that are dealing with rolling blackouts because at least for me i still have electricity in my house and i am using every bit of it for this heating i don't know how great it's going to be for the environment overall but you know you do what you got to do all right you do what you got to do um <laughs> <laughs> just yo know. but on the flip side we have an amazing guest who is just uh living the opposite life that I we're living she's based right she's currently set in New Zealand she's typically based in Dublin but she is New Zealander uh we got the general manager for women's all of women's rugby for world rugby Katie Sadlier, just an amazing person, so charismatic, had so much fun talking with her. And I uh, learned so much more, not just about her, but perspective and process that goes along with being able to put together something as amazing as the Rugby World Cup and putting on everything that World Rugby has been trying to get done uh, in the last, particularly the last five years. Uh, and it was just it was so refreshing and obviously you know to listen to someone who's humble but exciting who's in touch and, and is probably the highest level of rugby that we've had the opportunity of being able to talk to at this point um, I, I, I definitely appreciated it as any guest I mean we're talking about amazing people I, clearly the rugby community has no bounds like in terms of personality and charisma um, but just so dope to be able to, uh, to to speak with her and get so much. And I'm, I'm telling you, you guys are going to love this. This is such a great situation when it comes to just pure opportunity right now. But I do have to say, you know, we still had more Six Nations. I didn't get to watch the Six Nations this weekend because uh, I didn't want to, at this moment, pay for the uh, uh, subscription sheet fee for Peacock. 
Like I'm still I'm still trying to figure out what I want to do with all my streaming services, but uh, I, I got to go jump on that and get back on ESPN Plus uh, for whenever Super Rugby starts to kick back in again. And of course, we got MLR coming up in just a few weeks. It's just a few weeks. The beginning of March is when it starts. We're, I, it, I actually got lost in the fact that we are at the end of February. So, guys, we'll be looking out. Probably start adding some more stuff into the podcast. So, uh, you know, be, be, be ready. Be ready. And to be able to continue doing these podcasts and to be able to continue bringing in great guests like this, we got to be able to continue to push and I, I absolutely love the support that has been made with Rugby Outlet Mall. All right, Rugby Outlet Mall is the e-commerce store for rugby people who are trying to get into the lifestyle and society. We're here to be able to make sure that travel, that your day-to-day is full of the rugby life and is represented correctly. We're not just trying to set you up to have the typical uh, spill blood, play rugby kind of thing. No, we want to change it up where people can recognize that you're a rugby person, but also can feel familiarity with it uh, in, in all bases. We brought out some new gear. Uh, we got our rugby zon gear. We got our rugby ba- our rug babe gear for Valentine's Day. Even though it's past, we still have them up and available for a few more weeks. Uh, we're going to let them probably run all the way until the end of February before starting to pull them back. Uh, of course, we get the pleasurable HBCU Rugby Classic setup. So I can't wait to be able to show you what we have for that. Um, and just check it out. And of course, because you guys listen to this show, you guys are going to get 20% off all Gift Time Rugby and HBCU Rugby stuff. That is including the Valentine's Day stuff. That is including all the HBCU Rugby shirts and everything moving forward. 20% off, and all you have to use is coupon code GROWRUGBY. That is G-R-E-A-U-X RUGBY, R-U-G-B-Y, all one word, 20% off. It takes off the shipping and all a little bit off the cost, and I'm telling you it's going to be worth it. The shirts are so dope. You got hoodies. We're putting out the full outfit kit. Like We want to make sure that you rocked out all the way through because we want to make sure you're the flyest rugby people at the social, in your office, at school, at home, doesn't matter where because we want you to know that rugby life is more than just what you do on the field. It is that social network that connects you to the rest of the world for opportunity and adventures going through. So check it out. Grow Rugby. Uh, coupon code Grow Rugby at rugbyoutletmall.com check it out and of course uh always got to be able to put up for our documentary I, I still stand by it you guys need to check it out especially when it's cold like this and you want to be able to feel the warmth and be able to also understand this actually attacks really well with who we're speaking with go check out singapore to tokyo any way we can uh, it's the story of two guys, myself and my friend, as we bike road across Southeast Asia, Singapore, uh, Malaysia, Th- Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, and then all the way out to Japan for the 2019 Rugby World Cup and the adventures that we have on that. But most importantly, to be able to see just how deep the rugby culture is. $17, you get seven episodes 20 minutes an episode this is like wandavision uh except for without you feeling like you have to be snuck all the way through but you just get intrigued to see the full breadth of what is there to offer so definitely check it out available for anybody in any country singapore to tokyo i guarantee check it out you're gonna love it there's no doubt um Yo, and you can find it at Red Earth Films, R E D E A R T H Films, F I L M S, dot V as in Victor H X dot TV. Check it out. All right. Well, I don't want to hold you guys back. Get ready. The great, the legend, general manager for women's rugby for world rugby, former Olympian, swimming Olympian. Former <laughs> New Zealand uh, Athletic Sports Association, Katie Sadlier. Check it out. What's up?
What's up, everybody? Welcome to another amazing pro program of Grow Rugby. My name is Gift Gift Tommy Bailey, and we got this one is truly the VIPs of the VIPs. So coming out from World Rugby, number one when it comes to women's rugby, former Olympian, the GM, the legend, Katie Sadlier. Katie, thank you so much for coming through. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's wonderful to be here, Gift. I have to tell you, that is an amazing introduction, I have to say. So. I, I feel like I should stand up and do a pirouette. I'm going to take a bow before we start talking. But I'm here, I'm really looking forward to the session. Um, it's great to talk to you and all your all the, your listeners, um, wherever they may reside. And I hope you You know, I, it, 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 the honor is all ours. The honor is all ours. So, you know, I, I, I always like to talk where it was found. Um, and, you know, I learned about you. It was off of actually a couple articles. And, of course, when you get one good article, then you're like, wait, wait, how did I not know about this person? Then you start backtracking. And then, again, you go down. And I, I, I like to always say, I don't always like to say, this is what actually almost happened. You get carpal tunnel looking at the resume just from scrolling up. Like, my, my fingers almost got tired and started going out because I'm like, yo, She's so accomplished. <laughs> and so I was like, look, I, I need to talk to her. And then I actually was, when I was looking you up, I had friends that know you, um, or at least mutual friends. And, you know, I've heard such good things. So it was like, you know, you know what? We, we got to be friends. Like, I already know it's going to happen. But I was just like, we just need to make it formalized. All right. I needed her to know that we're friends now, too. <laughs> but, That's you know, so it's, it's great. Yeah, you know. I, I, I like to get started when it comes with anybody, any superhero origin story, where it always started. And you have a really, really interesting start to all this. So as I always say, how was it that you got started in rugby? Right. Oh, my goodness. Well, it is an interesting story because I, I was never um, I was never a player. Um, but, you know, I lived the majority of my adult life in New Zealand. And so from that perspective, uh, you know, it's part of the blood here. You know, you can't. Went into the water. <laughs> yeah, into the water. Exactly. You know, and for the for the last, um, I guess, ten years while I was in New Zealand, I now live in in Dublin. Although I happen to be in Auckland right now. You know, I can explain that. I came down for the World Cup draw, and I just decided to stay because it's, it's a bit um, it's a bit more relaxed in in this country than it is right now in Dublin in terms of how you can live. But I, I backed on um, the apartment I was living on, um, backed on to the Petoni Rowing Club. I mean, Petoni um, Rugby Club, actually, Petoni Rowing Club in the front, Petoni Rugby Club at the back. So I used to be able to sort of sit just on the deck and watch the Petoni, rowing, the Petoni Rugby Club do their thing. Um, but yeah, so, you know, my background, it, it kind of came into rugby because I had um, a wider sports background. So, you know, I was a. Uh, um, I was very involved in aquatic sports through majority of my athletic career. Um, and then when I re when retired from, you know, kind of being a, a water polo synchronized swimmer, competitive swimmer kind of person, I... Um, I like how you say it very casually, like this is not like <laughs> some of the hardest sports. You know, just a little bit of water polo, a little synchronized swimming, no big deal, competitive <laughs> swimming. I just know how to float into water. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I know, I always refer when people say to me, have I played... Rugby, I said, well, I played water polo. You know, there's kind of a lot of similarities there. Um, so I talk about that being my rugby in the water. Although I have been introduced in, in the job since I've been at World Rugby to videos of underwater rugby games. So that's Jeez. kind of interesting. So that would be a fun thing to give a try, particularly if you're in some tropical place. Um, I mean, you know, you know, they, it, I have, have some places in mind, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oceania, yeah. maybe they might have some, have some opportunities there. <laughs> Possibly, but yes. Yeah, so I so so I came into rugby. Um, basically, I had I when I finished being a competitive um, person athlete, uh, I started getting involved in sport as a volunteer. Um, sort of got involved in games team management, mostly like World Aquatic Games and things like that. And then, whilst I was doing my, um, I did a master's degree in sports management. I was approached by the New Zealand government to come and work in sport, and I just kind of had. Look, I mean, I, I'm so fortunate when I think back. I, I, I ended up working for about 25 years in a variety of different um, parts of the New Zealand sports system, including, I guess I always talk about my legacy was in the high performance space. Right. But I left, I left, I, I, got, I got to a stage, I left, um, and I was married to a rugby player for quite a bit of, of that period of time. I'm not, we're not married anymore, but, you know, so I, I, I kind of 
sort of um, was also sort of the fan engagement coming along watching the rugby when I wasn't doing my thing as well. Right. But, then, but then I um, I, I kind of sort of stepped out of sport and was doing some other things. I was still in sport and governance, but kind of stepped out to do some some other things more in the kind of performing arts world and a, yeah. and a bit more in aquatics. And kind of give it a little bit more roundedness to where you were yeah. trying to to envision. To envision and and um, yeah, I'll tell you a story about that about sport and art. I think there's a much more emergence and potential of those two industries working closer together. So that's kind of a personal belief of mine. But anyway, oh. so this so I kind of won this award, which was pretty exciting from the New Zealand government, where I won a, a lifetime achievement award for my contribution to sport. You, you um, casually saying big things is, is going to be the theme of the day, isn't it? I was quite excited. I was quite excited. And it was one of those really weird, weird moments when I had no idea where I was. I mean, I was going along to a, another sports dinner and I didn't really want to go. And my daughter kind of said, Mom, you know, I, I think I've been, I've been in Houston. I had been, it was just before the Rio Olympics. And I was working with the swim team, the New Zealand swim team, helping them with their pregames training camp which we we're getting up and running in houston and right. I, I got this invitation to go along to this awards dinner and i said to abby i said look she's my daughter's 25 i said look abby if there's two things that i'd like you to do while i'm away before i get back is get me out of that dinner i am not <laughs> i will be too tired and i was going to come straight off a plane and from the states into a dinner and then the other thing it, you know is probably not relevant for this audience <laughs> Yeah, I, I get to Wellington gotcha. and she says to me, she says, oh, mom, don't forget you've got the dinner. And I said, what dinner? And she says, the dinner, the dinner that you're going to. She says, I said, Abby, I'm not going to the dinner. And she said, yes, you are. She said, she said, mom, you've got to contribute back to sport. I said, this is my 25 year old life today. Anyway, so I went along to this dinner because, you know, she made me feel so guilty and sat down and, and unbeknownst to me, I was um, given this, um, this amazing award and my whole family had been um, invited and they, I didn't know that they were there. And when I was up, nice. getting the, award, the light went on the table and there was my mom and my dad. And it was all very tearful. Anyways, that aside, beautiful. Dinner. Well, I'm not going to lie. That, that's absolutely beautiful. Like your daughter had one job to do and she actually did it well. I mean, not in your favor yeah. initially, yeah. but still yeah. was very good at what she did. Exactly. She was very, very persuasive. <laughs> very, very persuasive. Anyways, the outcome of that dinner was that I did go away, you know, when, I, I was listening to what I would call my eulogy, but of course it wasn't my eulogy, but, the, but, but my legacy of what I had done. And I thought, oh gosh, I really love working in sport. What are, I mean, what are they saying, Lifetime Achievement Award? <laughs> and I made up my mind. I thought, not nah, open up, open up to possibilities. Something's going to yeah. come along and that's where you need to be. And then I saw this job and oh my gosh. So here, you know, literally two weeks later, um, I was approached saying, did you see the job um, that's going at World Rugby in Dublin as the general manager of women's rugby? And I thought, wow, that looks interesting. So I just started doing some investigations about, you know, what that might be and, you know, how would I feel at the age of 50 of moving to the other side of the world by myself and, and living in, in, in Dublin? And you know what? I just decided to put on my big girl pants and give it a, give it a shot and see Make what happens. Happen. And, uh, you know, it's the most amazing job. I, I love it. I absolutely love it. I love the amazing people I've met all around the world. And every time when someone asks me what I do, and, you know, you cannot buy, but smile when I say I'm responsible for developing women's rugby around the world. Mm -hmm. And they, they they then say, oh, do you mean in Ireland? And I say, no, <laughs> I do mean Ireland, but not in Ireland. Oh, well, where do you mean? I said the world. And, you know, it, it's just such a privilege. Such a right. privilege. Yeah, that's so amazing. That's how I got involved. But, you know, so I never played. I, I've watched lots and lots and lots from my back deck in back in <laughs> in, in Petone in Wellington, um, and um, clearly I was a big supporter. And I have lots and lots of very very close friends that were were very integral in inside the New Zealand Rugby Union because I used to look right. after sport, um, and I have met so many new friends over the last um, four years while I've had this amazing role. That's awesome. You know, I, I love, I mean, there's a lot to be able to build out from. And 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 I, if you want to continue to casually say big things, I'm also here for that as well, too. Uh, <laughs> you know, but I, I love the the factor of being able to kind of have this um, non-traditional journey into it because of the fact that we do always wonder sometimes, I, for me, it's always been wondering how much you are able to grow the game by doing things that happen to feel the same always like what has already been done been 
continuing it on. So for you coming outside the sport and ending up in this position, now your perspective comes out much wider. And you kind of mentioned one that I am a very big advocate of mixing the arts and sport together, particularly with rugby. Mm -hmm. So whenever you, but when you first start, stepped into it, you know, you're coming from this multiple sports background. Obviously swimming is your bread and butter, your foundation. What was at least one of the challenges that you had whenever it came to starting to uh, take your position in that role? Because again, rugby still provides something different, a different set of challenges, especially from a global standpoint. Uh, yeah. All things are definitely not equal. No, they're not. I mean, I, I think that, you know, one of the biggest challenges, because I believe, I really do believe that cross industry, cross sports, um, is the way of fast tracking and creating stuff that's really, really special. But when you come in from into a, a rugby environment, which at that stage was incredibly male dominated, you know, I, I remember I was kind of turned up at a, uh, a meeting before I started in the role in Buenos Aires. Um, and, and it was a, a council meeting. And of course, you know, when I started, there was no woman on council. <laughs> it was a governed by 30 men. Um, and it was a very male dominated kind of environment, but, I think that sometimes, um, you know, when you do do that, you're quite right. You can look at things very, very objectively. And when I came on, so, so the biggest challenge for me was I didn't have what I call credits in the bank. Like yeah. in New Zealand, you know, I had a bit of reputation of being a, a, a pretty good sports administrator. Right. I walk into Dublin, I walk into an environment. I had that New Zealand factor because everyone just assumed I played rugby. Right of course, of course. I must you be a black fern. I must and be. Anybody that crosses over that island walkway, you immediately are, you didn't know, you're a black fern, you know, you are part of the, every national team ever, and you might have played some professional. Woman exactly. or man. <laughs> Woman or man, yeah, definitely. Um, so, so, but what I did was I, I kind of decided really early because I saw, I mean, it was such an exciting time to join um, rugby. You just had the most amazing Olympic Games in, in Rio and people exactly. were walking, people were talking about rugby and we were see, you know, we were talking about it being the biggest growth. So it was on a roll and it really what it just needed, you know, and there'd been some great stuff that had happened prior to me being involved. So it wasn't starting completely from scratch. But what I did was I just kind of decided, well, you know, you play to your strengths. And you certainly don't try and pretend you're something that you're not. I mean, I'm not, you know, I would never start commentating on a rugby game and I don't pretend that I'm a rugby coach, but I understand coaching and I understand strategy and I understand relationships and I understand how you get people to, to really understand where good practice exists. So I kind of decided I had three mantras, which I, I keep repeating. And the first was I was brought in to develop a strategy to really take the game to the next level that people could believe in that I developed it with the people, you know, with the people for the people, that just sounds like I'm standing for some election, but <laughs> it was very much about listening, learning, understanding some of the challenges and the opportunities, understanding some of the frustrations that had been there in the past and understanding where some of the wins were. So the first thing, develop a strategy that everyone could, could believe in. The next one was to connect great practice and good practice inside the organization inside the industry called rugby, inside sport and, and across, across sectors. So connect good practice. And to do that, I think that the one of the real challenges, I mean, I'd worked in sport for a long time and I had worked in a couple of other, not international sport organizations, but in like high performance organizations. And, you know, I, I was very conscious of the fact that quite often global organizations kind of set themselves up if they know everything, you know, right. so that you turn around and pretend that you are the experts. You, you, you know, there's only one way to go from there. <laughs> it's, it's down. <laughs> you know, so, so kind of really trying to position us as a learning organization, recognizing that what we were was a catalyst for change and that what I needed to do was to connect all the great things that were happening and the great people that were happening and see how I could make that be, be even better. And then the third part, which I thought was really important, and I, I you know, I have a very, very good friend. Actually, I had dinner with her, with her just um, two days ago because she happens to be here as well. And um, her name is his Soraya Behrman, and she's got my role in FIFA. So she's the chief women's officer for um, FIFA, women's football. And she is from Auckland, and she got the job about two weeks after I was appointed into rugby. She was appointed to FIFA, and we met wow. in Auckland, and we said she was heading off to Zurich. I was heading off to Dublin, and we agreed that we would meet regularly, support each other, and challenge and check each other. And so, um, you know, it's been interesting watching the FIFA model unfold and the right. rugby model unfold because we started with the same kind of stuff. What are you going right. to do? And so one of my big challenges was, which is quite different from, from the FIFAs, is 
that um, it was about getting the accountability in the right place inside the organization and across the globe to drive the change. And by that, I mean, you know, when I arrived, you know, there was very much a, a oh, there's going to be a general manager of women's rugby and she's going to save things or she's going to fix right. things or she's going to, going to be the savior. I'm going to say here, and anything that said woman or girls might have been stuck on the woman, the gentleman, you know. And so the first thing that I guess I did was to to work with with Brett, who's now leaving, and but Brett and Bill and those guys to say, look, you know, we either run a model which means you have to build a unit, or we run a decentralized model which says everyone in this organization at World Rugby is accountable for women's rugby. It is not just me. So right. what, rather than have a huge unit. What right. I needed to do was to work with the chief executive to make sure that the KPIs are right across the organization and competition and commercial and in profile and development to really drive and get a sustained change um, with, with the ultimate brief that if we're successful in this role over, you know, this, the strategy is eight years, you shouldn't need to have a general manager of women's rugby. You should because actually the fact that you liquidate into each other. Yeah. Right. So those are the three things, you know, you know, develop a strategy, connect great practice and drive accountability inside and outside the organization. That would drive the change that we wanted to, 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 um, to see. And then we just started. Yo, I, and I love it. Well, and, and it's kind of interesting because of the fact of when it started too, because it wasn't just the fact that you had the Olympics right before that year before, but you were now Women's Rugby World Cup coming down in September. That was what you, you got in about Marchish. Uh, yeah, March January, January. January. Yep. Yeah. So you're so talking about. Say that again. So uh, yes, I so before so in my first year. Um, I started up in Dublin in January, and in December that year, we signed off on an eight-year strategy. But in that period, I used there was the the World Cup in in, um, in Dublin and Belfast in Ireland, um, and I used that as part of the kind of fact finding, getting to know the people who were key to what should be in that strategy that we approved in December. So yeah, so it was kind of a kind of a, a quick deep dive into being a sponge for a year. Learning, listening, learning, listening, learning, listening, and, and coming up with something that made sense. You know, and, and, and the other part that I, I loved about that, because I, I still want to even ask on the Women's Rugby World Cup, but what I really love about is the concept of accountability. And it was something that even now, uh, as the pandemic has gone through, that I have been hoping to be able to see happen because of the fact that there's always, it goes back to what I said, traditionalism. There's been the tradition of things happening in this occurrence. We're talking 1995, we're finally getting amateurism before the other 150, 200 years. You're, you know, you're working within this old model. All of a sudden, the change, now a whole new set of, of opportunities grow. Now we're 25 years later, or I guess by that point it was maybe 22, 23 years later, 22 years later. Now you are setting up a, a new era of rugby that's coming in. It's one that I think has become more women focused. It's one that has become more culturally focused, not rugby mm -hmm. culturally, but respective countries' perspective of culture focused. Yes. And Definitely. then, of course, the I, I like to say the safety era, where now yeah. we are trying to understand the actual uh, uh, medical impacts of it. But in that, to know that there was still the idea of you take care of yours, I guess, autonomy within the sections, to say yeah. the least, is, yeah. is, is an interesting one. And it does make sense. So for you, obviously, as you're, you're telling them to do that, now, what, when you're looking for these people and trying to bring it together, like, are you getting a lot of pushback as a result? Because it's, a, again, business as usual, and we're like, okay, now we'll change, or just, mm -hmm. okay, we're open now because we have to, yeah. because yeah. perception and reality. Yeah, I mean, uh, I guess, you know, I probably probably get labeled a bit as a disruptor. Um, yes! You know, Revolutionize! I'm very really happy with that. I mean, I was brought in to drive a transformation change. And, and you, you, you know, sometimes you have to push, sometimes you pull, sometimes you might say things that are awkward for other people in the room. I mean, world rugby and the globe of rugby is, is kind of, uh, you know, it, it's probably pretty typical of... Um, lots of other uh, sports where women are doing something that some people think they shouldn't be doing in terms right. of it's not your world. Now we obviously, we obviously disagree with that, but there will be people, there will be people that you work with that absolutely on board and they love it and they can't wait and they want it to go faster. There, there are people that you work with that don't 
you know, and, and there will be people that, that don't. And then there'll be a mixture of people that you work with that, you know, flip and flop between who's in the room. So you have to actually make sure you, you work. So it's been a huge stakeholder stakeholder um, engagement. But to be honest, you know, the, the changes that we have been able to do, and I, and I definitely say we because it is a collaborative effort um, across at a global level in world rugby in an incredibly short time, I think are amazing. You know, when I when I arrived, um, you know, what we, we set about to create this strategy and it wasn't like nothing had ever happened before. There was a really great woman, um, Sue Carty, who's actually on the World Rugby Council now representing Ireland, who was a development manager at World Rugby. And she did a lot of work in development. But when I looked at what was going on, I sort of said, well, you know, development is important, like what happens in, in unions in terms of participation programs. But if we don't fundamentally change the leadership and the people that are making the decisions to ensure that they reflect the people that are playing the game, it'll always be, you'll always be at the whim of someone deciding that they, they should do some, you know, switch something. So, so we kind of set up the strategy that had five pillars. So it was development, continue on the great work that Sue had done. Right. Performance, which was, and you can talk a little bit more about that, was because we knew that we had to uh, have a, a big gap in the 15s program in particular, sevens was going well, but that was about high performance, quality competitions, inspiring the next generation to get involved and in, in competitive pathways. Leadership, which is a big one, which I'll come back to, because there was a huge gap there. Um, profile with impact, we've done some pretty cool stuff, I think, in terms of our Try and Stop Us campaign and some of the other things that have happened globally. And then diversified investments, creating a commercial program. But fundamentally, the first thing we needed to do was leadership. Right. You know, if, if we could, and so you know, I'm really proud to say is that the the people that I worked with at World Rugby, and particularly um, Bill Beaumont um, and Gus Pichot at the time, and Bill and Brett, recognized that we had a real image, look, and feel problem. And so, right. when when at the ha when we were getting ready to develop the plan and sign it off, and um, a couple of people were talking about quotas. Should we put quotas in for unions about how many women on boards and stuff like that? And I just said, hold on, guys. We cannot do that. Look at us. We are a council of three. And, so, you know, and Bill, Bill said, you're absolutely right. And, and as a result of that, there was some thinking led by some of the senior managers internally. And Bill drove um, a change. And so when we signed off on the strategy, we brought 17 women directors onto the board of World Rugby. So it went from zero to 35%, just like okay. that. And most of the other international federations say, how did that possibly happen? Well, it happened because there was a total belief that how we looked, how we felt, how we were making decisions was wrong. You know, 27% of your membership are, are and, and growing and growing are women, yet we were 30 men. And though, you know, it's, it's kind of funny. So now, you know, the look and feel is different. You know, we're just in the middle of a, a further governance review and they've now made a target um, to move towards 40% on our committees and all our subcommittees. Um, we are seeing women in, we, we developed a pipeline program of scholarships and that's driven a change in kind of senior leaders inside organizations. I mean, we are hey, just we're talking about pipeline programs in terms of getting to administrative positions or pipeline programs in terms of just like performance and, and, and training on the field or just basic leadership within their own unions themselves. Yeah. No, we sort of we developed a pipeline program. So in the leadership, we, I sort of said, okay, we, we need to fix and work on improving the diversity on the highest level decision. So the, right. the governance. And we also, down needed, on that. we also needed to work on, you know, senior leaders inside the organization. So how do we get more women into senior leadership positions? And I defined those as chief executives or direct reports to the chief executives. And then, and then we had another whole thing that we might talk about in terms of we needed to change the diversity look and feel in terms of coaching. Right. Um, and we, we, we've got more work to do on match officials and I'm, I'm just about to start a, a really cool project in terms of athlete support. But so the pipeline program we put in place was a, a, was a scholarship program um, and uh, the US RAN has been very involved in that where we allocate yes scholarships per region on an annual basis um, for amazing women who want to be even more amazing to actually help them achieve their dreams and also um, add real leadership input to rugby so it's not about it's not about woman leading woman it's about woman in senior positions in general. For rugby. yeah so yeah. people like I mean I, I'm not sure if you've in, if you've interviewed um, 
you know, Dr. Aruba Chinto Ru from Canada. Canada. I, I'm literally, it was funny. I, because I, I talk with Rand and those, those are my guys over there. And I wanted to set up a meeting with her. Uh, I'm going to have to do one personally because they, we were working on something, but she's one that I actually was looking at just the other day. Um, just because of the fact that of where she's at and, and what she's been trying to do in Canada. And I, I didn't know to the extent of the scope of what she's been doing. Though. Yeah. So she's done some great stuff. So, that, you know, you, you've got, you know, there's some great um, leaders, with, you know, the executive leadership scholarship people from, um, from RAN, Rugby America's North, they set up a group called Wild Women in Leadership Directors. Um, you know, it's got people like Jen um, Hendrich. It's got people like Maria Thomas from Trinidad, um, Jill Potter. I mean, just a whole good group of women who are trying to drive change. In, and so th those are on scholarships. So we put scholarships together to actually allow them to, to um, explore, learn good practice, create a network. And, you know, the changes. Like I was just saying this morning, I was talking to someone um, in, in Ireland, and I was just saying, you know, when I first arrived and... I went to Buenos Aires, and at that stage, they were having this, these council meetings, right. and people from South America, and they were going on about how you know women and women don't really play rugby in South America; they play hockey. You know, you go into a club in Argentina, the women play hockey, the men play rugby, and it's never going to change. But yeah. we've now got Brazil, yep, Argentina, and Colombia, all, all with women, women chief executives. Yes, yes. I mean, wow. And, you know, Barbie Pichot, who, who um, is now um, appointed in both in Africa and in South America, we have kind of woman directors that are driving some of the programs at a regional level. I mean, it's just, it's just phenomenal. And so many, we've got, we've got five or six of our executive leadership scholarships are now on council. So they're part of the World Rugby Council nice. members. Um, and just scattering right across the Pacific. I mean, I just get so proud when I, when I sit and I listen, um, you know, we try to do a lot of profiles to track to track these people because it's all about, you know, if you see it, you can believe it. But of course. Just seeing, seeing what they're doing for rugby, you know, woman in rugby, driving rugby. And, and yeah, so that that to me was, was so important in terms of getting sustained change was to create that network of leaders at a governance and a senior level inside unions who um, could support each other and really drive rugby's change for the benefit of rugby, which means a much stronger woman's contingent. And you know, I, I love, and that part always has made sense to me, especially whenever I started playing. So I, I started playing maybe about 12 years ago or so. So even in the development, one of the areas that always felt odd to me uh, initially was you have this whole entity. This is one sport, one sport where contacts is primary and is expected that women play outside of individual sports in uh, AKA MMA and boxing. Um, and then you could talk about maybe American football, but I don't think it's going to have the plane that rugby can just by the culture of, of the sport here in the States. And even field hockey is not going to ever be to the extent, I guess maybe water polo. But when you're talking about a, on, on average, a team sport, rugby was one that women have the most congregation to. And I remember whenever I went and saw, the women's, the Atlanta Sevens uh, a few years back, maybe about 2014, 2015, and you saw that the level of talent actually matches the expectations that you have for the national team. So basically, you're playing with the best athletes. They play smoothly, amazingly, and hit hard faster than you ever expect. Not just ever expected, like fast, like you expect from an elite player. So. Yeah. When you have this section that's able to develop and you also have a corner on a niche that is basically on its own in, in, in the grander scheme, you would think go ahead and tap that because that is your growth rate. Like if you get yeah. women involved, the men will come either from children or it's just going to be a complementary condition, almost tennis, the same con concept that tennis had. So yeah. I, I'm, the fact that they you guys started pushing down more into that, I, I love it. But And the scholarship component. Now, with the scholarship, was that in the factor of like you helped them to find classes and help them afford for classes? Or was this travel to be able to train at the World Rugby facilities? Or what was the extent of the scholarship? And of course, if you guys love this podcast or even like it, we just need a few favors from you. If you guys can, can you go on to Apple Podcasts? Can you guys leave a review for us? 
anything works, whether preferably we want the five stars, but we want your most honest review because it helps us get found a lot more. Secondly, if you guys can, please share this podcast. Let your friends know we get the most algorithmic pushes whenever these things are shared, not just liked, but shared. Every listen counts, and we appreciate everything that you guys do. If you feel like there's real information that comes from it, please continue to push that along. And finally, if you guys can, check us out on YouTube. Like the uh, our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash gift time rugby network. Um, obviously, we want to continue to be able to show just the visual as well and continue to press this as, uh, as our show as we continue to grow over the next few years, and especially leading into the Olympics and the Rugby World Cup. And of course, like us on Instagram at Grow Rugby Show, uh, G-R-E-A-U-X Rugby Show, and all one word. And obviously, it allow you to see whenever we're posting up something and uh, we're going to keep trying to get updated. We're, we're getting there. We, all the process, man. This is something about developing rugby industry. So enjoy it. And I, I want to thank you guys so much for this. The scholarships, I mean, they're, they we, we call them executive leadership scholars. So we work with the regions to identify people who are either you know new to boards, so at a governance level, or who are in senior leadership or who have the ability to be there in two years. It's a ten thousand um, pound scholarship, so it's quite significant. Big but we sit down with this with them as part of their application. They kind of put forward their story, you know, who they are, what they've done, what their vision is, and what they think they need to do to get there. Um, we get, once they're, you know, we work with the regions, and it's actually happening now. So you know, Rand will be um, uh, submitting. I think, but everyone's got to the end of this month to submit the next year's scholarship recipients. Um, so we then. We then get the regions to prioritize, you know, with the lists of, of, of amazing women, you know, who do they want to put forward? We provide them with a mentor um, right. from somewhere else in the world, because I mean, it's actually about getting some global perspective as well. And, and that network the increasing. Thank you, right? Yeah, and this, the scholarship they do, it, it kind of really varies. I mean, we, we've tried to make sure that it's not a one size fits all. It's about right. what works for, for them. Uh, and, and it doesn't have to be one thing, you know, like it, it, a lot of them have done um, international travel. You know, I think of um, Maria Thomas from um, Trinidad. Trinidad. You know, I, I, I kind of first met her. There was an, I was speaking at a conference in Botswana and there was four of the leadership scholarship recipients that decided to go to this conference. It was a huge international women in sport conference. So she was down there and now she's just come back a very long time. She was doing her a master's degree in Russia. Um, she was stuck in, in Russia for quite some period of time. So she did, a, you know, a mixture of international travel, some um, dedicated courses, some conference thing, and just some kind of learning from other other unions. So it's what is right for you. You right. know, I, I think that one of the really big success stories, and I talk about the scholarship programs, was when the first scholarship recipients came through from Africa. And we had these women, and there was this woman who was, who was the president of uh, Burkina Faso. Her name is Roland Foro. And Roland, um, I met in um, in Botswana at a women's leadership um, conference on how they're going to take rugby in Africa to the next level. And she couldn't speak English. She, you know, she was fluent French, and she couldn't speak English. So I have a very pigeon French kind of perspective. So we did. We we we, we got on. There's lots of hugs and shakes. Middle ground. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, she wanted to learn it. She decided she wanted to get involved in globally in in world rugby, and she needed to master English. So her scholarship revolved around mastering English. And yeah. I have to tell you, she's now on the board of Rugby Africa. So she's the president of Burkina Faso. She's on the board of Rugby Africa and she is Rugby Africa's council member on World Rugby. Um, and she is on several subcommittees. And she was at the, um, I, I was privileged to go to the World Cup in Japan. Yeah. And there was a council meeting there and she came running up to me, fluent English, fluent. <laughs> And gave me a hug, and I was just no. What can you say? Does that no. make So there she is, and she's just she's a mover and a shaker, and she's just doing great things in in the rugby continent of Africa. But you know that's so that so it's everything from that through to full time university programs through to personal development. It's what does it take to actually help you get to that special spot where you can really lead and feel confident. That's what they're about. They're really cool. See, it, it, I, I want, so 
kind of you, you, you spoke on this, going to the uh, Rugby World Cup in, in Japan. So a friend of mine, we actually ended up doing a, a bike ride from Singapore to Tokyo, literally. Wow. Singapore to Tokyo and uh, do, bike riding through Southeast Asia, essentially, getting to see it and then on our way to the 2019 Rugby World Cup. And one thing that I was able to kind of see through that was the usage of rugby, not just to change a, an environment, because we always talk, we always know about, you know, the individual change, but how it actually changes the culture of an area. Uh, namely, the one that stood out the most uh, was with, uh, uh, in Cambodia, with uh, the, this group, Kampachia Balap, uh, run by Nicholas Olivri. And uh, he, his, the girls that he was, that were under his program, uh, this was one never seen such young girls absolutely dominate into tackles like like it was unfair the amount of domination that they were doing. I was like, wow. But what really stood out was when talking with them, uh, you hear about obviously the, the the stories that they have, and it was the confidence that gets built up for the women, the girls themselves, and then on top of that. Because of the confidence they've built up from being able to play and knowing that they can do this competition, their expectations of what they want for themselves increase substantially. To do that, and that means you're completely changing the way your culture, and this, because of such a young generation, this is literally going to change the country over the course of 40 years. From just these one, two, three, four years of playing rugby, and to hear that, and you used a perfect example with this lady from uh, the Burka, Burkina Faso, uh, like, to have her learn, that is a cultural change that will resonate itself back which is where I've always felt like has been needing to promote rugby in was its global impact uh, in terms of how you can create the opportunities, uh, not so much as less so than the pitch, but just not maybe equal to or a little bit higher than what you do on the pitch because it, it, it something facilitates differently. And I have to say, I mean, you know, that was the real attraction for me. I mean, I, I've been very fortunate in my sporting career in, in terms of, both as an athlete and as a volunteer. And then I, you know, I was responsible for New Zealand's high performance system. So I've been to, you know, nine Olympic and Commonwealth games. You know, I've been to a lot of the kind of glitzy, aspirational, inspirational, um, I'll, I'll borrow something from a, a colleague, eye-watering experience. <laughs> um, I didn't need to do more of that. I mean, it's fun, it's great. And, it, it, but what really hooked me on, um, you know, was when I applied for this job, I kind of really felt that I wanted to do something that you, that where sport was used for sport for development in terms of women's empowerment and social change. And the project I was asked to do as part of my interview process was what would I do with £100,000 to develop rugby for girls in Asia linked mm -hmm. to the Rugby World Cup and the Tokyo Olympics. And to do that, I called them back and I said, okay, look, you know, for me to do this, uh, properly, properly. It was an interview. I said, I need to know where I'm in this process because I either do, I have to call a lot of people in Asia that don't know me and I don't right. know me, I don't even know if this the same language. <laughs> Anyways, um, I, um, I was really fortunate. I was told I was in the top three, so I thought I'm going to do this. And I, I contacted a lady, a, a very, very famous um, ex Blackfern World Rugby Hall of Famer called Anna Richards, who was at that oh. stage coaching in, um, in uh, Hong Kong. And she connected with me with quite a few of the other the people who were coaching and or involved in women's rugby in Asia. And I came across, which is probably maybe what you saw in Cambodia, I came across this program called Pass It Back, Child Fund Pass It Back. Yep. Which was, I know you too. So which I was a, too. Yeah, which was which was a program that was aimed at so and I just looked at this and I thought, oh my gosh, this is why I want to do this. This is yeah. absolutely why I want to do this. And you know, with rugby for sport for development, we've been really, really lucky. We've partnered with a variety of different um, NGOs in different parts of the world. So, Child Fund in Asia, UN Woman in Oceania, you know, a variety of different who. And so, we've been able to look at you know social development goals and how do we make life better for people. And I have to say, you know, I'm always really proud when I think about the when we, what we really try to portray with our Try and Stop Us campaign is that rugby is a game for all shapes and sizes, all cultural um, right. aspects, and that it is growing phenomenally in places that you just would not think it would. Right. And, you know, it's in Iran, it's in Malaysia, it's in Pakistan, it's in India. India. Exactly. And, you know, I've, got, I've got a lady who I'm 
do to speak to in the next few weeks who's doing a, a research project and why is why is rugby as such a physically contact sport growing so much amongst Muslim women and uh, and you know what it's a question that I really want to delve into because there's something special about our sport you know the passion that people put in and and that it is excelling in places where human rights may be very questionable for, in terms of women and and right. where they fit and what they should do and what they shouldn't do and 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 so I think you know it, it it's kind of it's an amazing sport to actually drive those social change and stigma about what people can and cannot do and and there's something about that power you know that when we talk about rugby builds character um, it's that physical power it's that collegiate experience on the on, right. the, on the pitch um, it makes leaders for life and it creates that support and it, and, and it allows you to step up and stand up to things that might not be great um, in a non-rugby environment, knowing that you've got a support network of people that are there to support you with it. I mean, it's such a huge, I mean, we talk about it being a club of all clubs. People yes! Rugby, all love rugby players. And you know, you can just pick up, you know, gifts, you can pick up your ball and you can, you can turn go. up in an invercargill and you could just go and play a game with the right. And you know, it is no, people are just so welcoming and embracing. It is such a, you know, I, I used to know that lots of Kiwis, you know, they always go overseas and they do their big OE because you know we're in this little isolated <laughs> island, it's quite a bit blissful right now. But it's so far away from the rest of the world. They take their backpack and they take their rugby ball. Right. And it's such it's it's kind of like this global handshake. Hey, can we play? You know, it's quite special. It's very very special. And it, it's it's one. It was that's just a, really was the same reason why it actually sold me uh, as well. Because again, for me, I play football. You know, I'm I've played soccer. I'm more. I'm a contact sport guy for the most part. So you know, being on the pitch was was a natural experience. I mean, don't get me wrong. You get the nuance stuff like that. But what actually ended up taking me over was the network, and then actually even more so, which was maybe about four years ago, 2016. So five years ago when I actually went out of the country playing rugby. And then you start to actually feel like the breadth of it and you feel that network that comes along with it. So, but at, at the same time, when I went overseas, I also got to see like you, weirdly enough, the same issues that I feel happen in non-rugby, like even in the US, I feel is the same, almost same problem that you have in Brazil, which is the same problem that you have in uh, Singapore, well, maybe not Singapore, but in like Malaysia, uh, or the same problem that you have in, in in the Caribbean. Like, there's always these few integral problems that seem to be resonating, and it, it kind of came back to this idea of, despite us knowing how you know connected rugby is, how passionate people are for rugby, yet in every country, rugby still doesn't stand to be in that top three for the most part. Like. It's make New Zealand, slightly South Africa, ironically, and then and then like the, a bit, a bit. Well, no, not really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no, exactly. really. It's, it's, and then the 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 Oceania Islands uh, at, at that. Fiji. So exactly, Fiji, Fiji primarily, Samoa, Samoa and, and, exactly. So if you have it in every country, you know that the people love it who played or in association with it in every country are really deep into it. Why has it still been so hard for it to rise up the rankings of, of national notoriety of a team? Like in England, you would think it would be a top three sport, but I would argue that you football is number one. You probably might put basketball there, maybe cricket and netball number three or four, and then mm. maybe rugby right at that that bottom part. And even mm. South Africa was the same, netball, soccer, that, and then you have rugby, despite the fact that these are major rugby countries. So from mm. what when you were, as you're looking at it from the inside out a little bit, yeah. what is it that you're seeing that could be creating this trend? Yeah, I mean, I think, look, I think it is changing. I mean, we talk about, you know, we started from a reasonably small base in comparison to some of those other global sports. I mean, like, like I said, I mean, I, I, I kind of meet, like I said, I meet regularly with football, my, my football equivalent. And I talk about how we've got, you know, 2.7 million women playing rugby, playing football. And she talks about 30 million, you know, so we were at kind of different sort of scales. True. But some of our challenges are the same. I mean, I think that one of the things that, that we have tried to do from the woman's perspective is the fact that 
you know, we needed to address the international global calendar. I mean, the, the people who play rugby in the Six Nations area, they're so lucky, you know, that yeah. they've got that regular competition for 15s. Sevens, okay, we're kind of, it's kind of growing. It's, 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 it's getting there. But when it came to 15s, huge gaps in the global, you know, if you were, you know, there's a World Cup once every four years, but there wasn't a regular competition besides that for anywhere else. So we've been spending quite a bit of time trying to, you know, and so watch this space is what I can say that, you know, hopefully we'll have some really exciting news coming out in the next couple of months about something that's really special that I think is going to be a game changer for the growth of women's rugby. Um, <laughs> but at the other stuff, you know, I mean, I guess the thing is, 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 you know, that's kind of, I, I don't know. I mean, when I look at other countries, it seems that, um, Rugby in a lot of those countries, you come into it as a late, um, as a as a more mature adult. Right. Whereas in those sports, you're starting from you know starts from scratch. Right. Um, now that's not the same. So in New Zealand, you pick up a rugby ball when you're three. You know, right. we start. <laughs> but in, in other countries, I know that it's something that you start at university level, and you you know, so it's kind of you've got that huge kind of gap of 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 building that pipeline that needs to be addressed. So sort of understanding what's going on is it a is it the first sport that people have done or is it the second or third sport that they've done but what we do know is that when people play they love it they you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know and, and all sorts of people you know there's just you know we're really lucky we've got um angela um, ruggiero from um you know the amazing ice hockey uh medalist from the states you know four times olympian um who's on our board and she was telling me that she just can't wait to, you know, to play. She's based in New York. And I said, well, I need to connect you with, I think she knows Phaedra. Yeah, um, that's, that's a homie right there. There's a, that's a history there. But so I think things are changing. I mean, you know, yeah. clearly, you know, one of our biggest things that we need to grapple with is um, the, per the perception about the safety associated with our sports. So, I mean, we, you know, and, and I think, you know, I have been incredibly impressed. One of the, one of the jobs I had um, prior to coming to work at World Rugby was I was responsible for injury prevention in New Zealand, and one a subset of that was sports injury prevention. So we had kind of a, quite a unit. We actually had a dedicated rugby person, but we looked right across sports because I worked for an organisation called ACC, and in New Zealand you're covered twenty four seven. Um, if you have an injury, the government nice. covers you, whether it's in sport and home on the road or whatever you're covered. Right. Um, so um, when I arrived at World Rugby, the amount of investment that's put in terms of injury prevention and education and coach education um, and providing leadership to other sports that have that are physically demanding. So there certainly is a huge emphasis to make sure that we can make this sport as fair and safe as possible. But that is obviously a challenge for some people. They look at it and they sort of think, you know, it, it is a physically demanding sport that right. will be attractive to some people um, it'll be attractive for some people from an audience and an engagement perspective and others from a playing perspective. But what I do know is I don't know many people who who um, who have not tried who who have tried rugby that haven't got hooked in it. You know what right. I mean? I see you know, from a watching perspective. You know, I yeah. I was I always talk about the taxi the taxi driver test. When I was in Dublin, you know, I was whenever I go to the Olympics or something like that. <laughs> You know, the fact is, you're sitting in there with a taxi, and if a taxi driver starts to talk to you and says to you, have you watched the woman's rugby that's on in Belgium? Right. And, and then they start saying, oh, my gosh, oh, I didn't think women were going to ever be any good at this, but, my gosh, that game was better than any men's game I ever saw. You know, it's kind of cool. So it's, it's one of those addictive sports, isn't it? We just need to create more opportunities for the addiction. You know, I, I agree. I agree. I, I, I still stand by. I, I feel like there is a, a cultural factor within rugby of absolute humility within the team. So it makes it difficult to have the, the marketable voice because to marketably voice means that you have to bring spotlight to self. Mm -hmm. And I think that might be kind of part of the cultural issue that goes along with it. No, which, I, no I in team. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So one thing that you, you spoke about on in terms of what you wanted to develop, and I'm not going to take you too much longer, but I, I got to get these two out, and I'll be honest with you, I could talk to you all day because you are so bloody interesting. I love it. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, you talked about one, one of the pillars that you wanted to work on was commercial development, yeah. uh, which is one issue that I think has been prominent in just about every rugby country. I don't care, big or small, seems to be the prominent issue. Now, uh, I, I've talked with uh, talking with friends even here. Uh, I had one one of my friends. His name's Tozan Tutitanwe. 
One thing he always used to say that is within the U.S., rugby doesn't know what it wants to be. Does it want to be an adult rec league? Does it want to be a serious professional? Or does it want to just be an amateur social kind of uh, process? So yeah. a lot of that obviously changes towards what you want to do. And I think for the most part, people want to be able to play while supporting something and then at least be able to see a high level of it be able to be performed regularly. For you, you know, this part, when it comes to a worldwide aspect, you know, we talk about these small countries, the Asias, up in the continent of Africa, within the Middle East, and then let's not even talk about what we're doing in South America, even here in North America. Um, what is it that you have been able to see that comes with maybe the issue that a lot of rugby teams or rugby programs, unions and such are having when it comes to engaging with commercial entities and and, and what do you feel is, is it possible that World Rugby, at least from your position, is able to do to kind of facilitate that, help that? Yeah. You know, I mean, commercial, the commercial, chasing the commercial dollar is hard. I mean, it is. Yeah. I mean, it's not, it's not easy. You know, we've got that fourth pillar. Um, sorry, the last pillar in, our, in the global strategy for women is about creating diversified income streams. And in there, um, and it deliberately talks about diversified, in that we, we talk about four different things that we're going to try to do. One is the strict commercial, which I'll talk a little bit about. The next is how do you create more meaningful um, for-purpose funding partnerships? So the NGOs and the agreements and stuff like that. So what are the, where are the win-wins in terms of social change and the things that rugby can do in terms of building communities and, 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 and working with at-risk kids and all that kind of stuff. So there's that. And how do we actually, um, yeah, sorry, now I'll go to the fourth one is, the third one is, is kind of philanthropy. And I think that's, yeah. once again, that's an area that I think that we could learn a lot more from the arts world on. You know, right. sports has been overly great. I mean, I know in the States, um, there is a, uh, there's a, a very successful rugby foundation. Um, yeah, it, I, don't rugby foundation. That, I don't know that that happens everywhere around the world. So, you know, a couple of the unions have them, some don't, but actually understanding that, you know, if you even if you think about where people are that were rugby players and where they sit in the commercial society and how do you actually get them back from a philanthropy perspective to donate? So how do you set up the trust? But the fourth the fourth bit, and I'll go back to the commercial, is about capability build. A lot right. of our unions and a lot of the organizations you're talking about do not have the resources to have leading commercial directors that that have the capability and skills to drive the commercial programs, let alone service them. So we've kind of made a commitment um, to also see what is it that we can do to help in that space to um, provide toolkits so that organizations actually understand how to go about it. And, the and so then going back to the first thing is looking at it from a commercial perspective and a woman's perspective. You know, up until last year, the, the commercial um, deals for rugby were all what I call bundled. Right. So, you know, so what we would sign off on was worldwide wide partners um, that would be associated with the, the Rugby World Cup for Men. Mm -hmm. And as part of um, negotiating the part of the Rugby World Cup for Men, you would also have thrown into that agreement, oh, yes, and you can have the woman, oh, and you can have the under-20s. So it was kind of an agreement that, that the rights for those others were all bundled up into one. So we made a call looking at the trends of what's going on globally and seeing um, what was happening at a regional level to unbundle the rights last year. So we decided that women's rugby was at a stage where it was growing, that it had the it, it had sufficient potential from a commercial and a social change perspective to right. be able to hold separately. So we developed a separate commercial strategy for the women's game. And we did that by understanding what was going on around the globe. Um, and and what we've we've done is we're we're looking for um, we're trying to look at the commercial perspective quite differently. So okay. yes. Um, big events are important, so you know yes. eyeballs. But we're, 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 in looking at the research in terms of women's corporate sponsorship, we know that that people want to buy into more of the the of the IP associated with social change stuff. So we've yeah. got we're, we're looking right now. So we developed a commercial strategy. We kind of launched it um, just just after the World Cup in 2019, in the middle of a COVID kind of environment. So it's kind of was a bit <laughs> bumpy, um, but we're kind of back on track now where we're looking for six global partners of women in rugby, but each right. of those partners is linked to a pillar of work. So one for coaching, one for leadership, one for development group, and, and they get access to the IP that we're developing globally with that, as well as the traditional kind of brand sure. eyeballs, especially with events. Nice. So that's kind of like an interesting, so, 
clearly we, we, we want to share that with our unions as a, as a way, but we're just starting, I mean, we want to get some success stories of how it's going to work and then, exactly. then show our unions how that actually can happen. But it is, it's incredibly, it's a, it's a tough market out there in terms of commercial. Um, and particularly when the world has got so many really good, good needs that are there. So I think that the challenge is, is to look slightly non-traditional at right. how you can create your investment schemes, having a diverse mix so right. that it's not just about finding sponsors, it's about finding strategic for purpose funding partners. Um, you know, the CSIR stuff is also about philanthropy and, and having a wider look and feel about um, how you pull that all together. And I, I think that was one area that I, I found very um, troublesome in that we've always been currently because even within rugby clubs now, I can you can almost predict, and I feel like this is, has always been consistent on how a club wants to do it. It's we make it into a nonprofit, and then we will say that we're going to sell patches and names and some very minuscule to be to get you know one two thousand dollars, and then hopefully rinse and repeat that. And of course, then you go through the alumni base, where yeah. I, and you know it's it's like I, I get why people do it because I'm sure there was a reason that template worked for a while, but it's not sustainable. And I think it all constantly inhibits growth, especially if you have clubs that are in flux as they're developing. So mm, you, yes. you find, run into this issue of how do you get them to see further? And then again, you mentioned it right there. It's so hard to, it, there's a reason why it's a full-time job to go find mm. brand deals is, and people on often are not playing because they're looking to get paid They're you know, they got their jobs and their lives that they have to deal with. So, trying to find that middle ground. And then if you're talking about from the collegiate side, it becomes that whole other issue of like, these are students, like they're students. Yeah. Like they, they, they're still having their lives. They're, they're still growing in that aspect too. So you're basically asking them to do something big. So I, I do always wonder when it comes to, if there's a serviceable means of being able to create even a blueprint for these teams and these regions and these unions to do it because it feels like once you get past that level, then it's just about sustainability through recruiting, and then what can you do to create attention from there? And I guess it, all of it kind of yeah. revolves around the same yeah. thing. It does, but you know, but it is about you know sitting down with innovative people and just and maybe maybe um, from a rugby club perspective, kind of bringing wider people into that thinking tank. I mean, I, I went out last two nights ago. Very fortunate because you can do that in New Zealand, <laughs> and I went out with the. Um, the commercial director of the New Zealand Olympic Committee, and she was talking to me about they have an incredibly innovative. I thought, gosh, that's innovative. Where they have a, a so this is the, the look after the New Zealand, like the USOC, and yeah. they have a sponsorship deal with a building, a, a home building company called Jenny and Homes. The mm -hmm. sponsorship deal is 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 like this: they build five homes, so they call them the Olympic houses, and oh, wow. they 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 then sell these houses. Um, inside the houses is all the other products, so Panasonic and anything else that they have as sponsorships inside the house. So it becomes nice. a show. It gets marketed as an Olympic home, so it gets kind of really cool Olympic you know, outfit signing and stuff like that. And the, the sponsorship deal is that they get the profit from the house when it's sold. You know, that's incredible. That is amazing. Mean? I've heard, you know, this, this maybe sounds very, very New Zealand. And I remember, you know, I was working with. Um, some people in the Waikato, which is where the farming country is in this one. And um, I remember there was deals that were being done with dairy, uh, with um, farmers, and right. uh, um, where they would dedicate so many bobby calves to certain clubs. And when the, cl the you know, the clubs, the cows grew, I mean, probably any vegetarians that are on this audience probably don't really like the okay. that. Exactly. But, you know, I mean, it's just, I guess what I'm saying is it's thinking outside the square in terms yeah. of where the publishers would be. And so, you know, so that was the, the value of the, the growth in the, in the, um, in the farmer contributing towards the club. So, you know, thinking outside the square, I guess I think that's the kind of idea. No, I, I love that. Like it, and, and it, that is probably the most factual thing that can be said within that arena. Like, Sometimes it is step out, not even sometimes, it is absolutely about stepping outside of those bounds, especially whenever you have a sport that's, for most people, relatively either unknown or new for them, you know? So it yeah. like, now you have this, this awe experience of, and for me, my experience has always been, if I tell somebody about rugby that I do in rugby, they'll be like, wow, 
You do that, you're crazy. Yo, that's a rough sport. And you're like, all right, well, look, I'm going to have to flex this a little bit. Yeah, yeah it absolutely is. You know, we, we are badass. You know, this, why don't you come help us out a little bit? You want to be a part of that, attached to it. But it does add that um, that that extra level of uh, benefactor, benef- benefic- uh what's the word I'm looking at? It's I know, I know beneficial exactly. for both beneficial. parties. Yeah. 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 You know. And I think, the, you know, the other thing, Gift, is, is – you know, when I think of um, some of the amazing uh, people from rugby that I've met in, in the U.S., um, when I, I in my first year I came over to San Diego, I think it was for the it, it was the was it the trials for was it the men's trials for the World Cup and there happened to be some women's games on. Anyways, I met they the, they were inducting the um, the women's national team in, into the Hall of Fame, and so I met quite a lot of the amazing women. And you, you know, and you were sort of sitting there and you're talking to them, and then I met them again. There was a, a conference that the um, Women's Rugby Coaches and Referees Association ran in the other side of the states quite a bit later, and and I met some of them then. And you kind of sort of started talking to these people, and you found out what they were doing in their careers. You know, oh so these goodness. were, these, oh my goodness, so, like you know, uh, quite often we don't think about expanding that network and keeping that network. I mean, we, we really want people who are involved in rugby to be involved in rugby for life. Right. And as you, when you think about, you know, the importance of team sports and in terms of leadership development, a lot of these people are leading large companies. You know, how do you connect them? I mean, we've got a group that's working with the World Cup in New Zealand right now, um, which they call the um, uh, Wahini Toa. So Wahini woman from the island and the knowledgeable woman where, where, um, uh, Dame Julie Christie, who's the chair of the Women's World, no, sorry, the Rugby World Cup for Women, bad, um, <laughs> brought together um, all these women who are, you know, head of banks, head of large corporations to sit right. down and think about, you know, that some of them have been associated with rugby. How do they actually use their contacts to look at creating more um, investment into the game? So I think that's kind of ways of, you know, unpicking who knows who in a, in a more systematic um, way and what people are currently doing in their roles and, right. and how do you actually try and tap into some of that incredible knowledge and expertise and leadership? No, and, and it goes back again, the global network, the global club that rugby is. Yeah. It, it, it is a net yeah. that spreads far wider than people ever expected to. And it's kind of the amazing part. So it makes sense to try and go tap into it. And, and I think that that part has always been interesting to me because you do find out like, Oh, you guys are, wait, you're a medical, medical doctor, or you're working in this corporation. You know, you have, you're the, I've met so many people who ended up being um, like either this massive architect or they are uh, a, this dentist, high level dentist, so, you know, these really professional careers that you go yeah. like, I wouldn't have even put the connection because, well, there's nothing that ever made me think about it. It's so way yeah. shaped, but it is incredible what some of the backgrounds are that go with that. Yeah. Um, kind of, kind of wrapping it down on this. You know, you, you, you obviously, man. I really, we're gonna have to do this again, Katie. I'm look. We're gonna do it again. You know? As we go to the World Cup, maybe we're all, well, we're at the World Cup. We can. Do okay, so here's again. here's the question that I need to ask. This is the number one. So what 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 are we doing about the Rugby World Cup uh, for this year? Because you know, there's some of us who you know we. We, we, we are not necessarily in New Zealand, and we'd love to be able to come to New Zealand with our media, and we like to know, hey, you know, can we be invited in? Like, you know, obviously with the, the COVID. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, obviously New Zealand has a very strict COVID um, uh, ruling when it comes to incoming yeah. foreigners. So um, what is it that you guys are looking? Because I just saw an article talking about you guys are aiming to try and have the highest attendance record ever for a rugby world cup uh and which is hitting a marker especially after 2017 uh what what is it that you guys are looking to plan to do within this pandemic restriction is is there a plan in place or yeah well i mean obviously we're working incredibly closely and this is one of those classic cases of we're just uh, making sure the accountability lies in the right place across the organization <laughs> so we have a we have a an event director, a lady called Allison Hughes, who works at World Rugby, is part of the you know the World Cup team, um, and then she works very closely with a very committed um, New Zealand organizing committee, and they, in conjunction, are working very closely with the government to to make sure that they do everything they can. Clearly, safety is an issue. You know that Perhaps. New Zealand is a is a country that 
um, has got strict quarantine guidelines and um, but we are working with the government to make sure that um, that we do what is right for both the country and the participants that are that are coming. So that will mean, I mean, you know, so that will mean a mixture of things. It's, it's really important to make sure that people who do not get to New Zealand can see everything, so that we make the as live um, environment in terms of our broadcasting as, as incredibly impressive and engaging for fans as, as possible. Right. Um, but it is, it's, it's kind of tough. It is, it's, it is a tough environment. I mean, I, 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 I'm really feeling for all the Olympic athletes who, you know, that's happening mm -hmm. beforehand, who have got some specific challenges about getting in and out of, of Tokyo and quarantine associated with either side back and forth as well. So wh what I can say is that it is discussions that are ongoing on a regular <laughs> basis to, um, to make sure that everything that can be done will be done to to make this the the best ever. When it comes to audiences, well, clearly every single person in New Zealand is a rugby fan. So you know, <laughs> well, well, true, true. Well, you know, you look. I, I expect the eight million people to be there. I, I, true stories. <laughs> Yeah, but it, you know, you know, we're yeah. So, like I said, a very committed government. This New Zealand's hosting, which some people don't know. We we're talking about um, there. They talk about it being the big four. Um, New Zealand is hosting the Rugby World Cup um, for women this year, the um, Cricket World Cup for women oh, next year, Lord. and the Football World Cup for um, in a joint hosting with Australia the year after in 20, um, 2023. And also they're hosting this huge conference, which is called the International Women's Sports Conference next year. So four major events in this country. So you've got a prime minister that's absolutely, and a, and, a, and a deputy prime minister that are absolutely passionate about women, sports, leadership. Um, and so it's an exciting place to be right now. You just need to be able to get inside there and be yeah. able to actually. <laughs> no, I, I, how much of it are you guys looking off of the Olympics? Because my theory has always been like what you guys do with the World World Cup there is going to be based off of what the Olympic Committee ends up doing for Tokyo, you know, three, four months prior to that. Do you, yeah. Are you guys in coos with them or? Oh, 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 yeah, clearly. I mean, at a world rugby level, we're part of kind of, I mean, obviously we're an Olympic sport, so there's a lot of dialogue that happens with, with our competitions team from sevens to actually understand what are the key learnings. Uh, you know, and there's been some trials. There's been some sports that have come and played in New Zealand in the, in the close, you know, some netball teams that have come over, rugby teams that have come over. So they're, they're kind of just trialing it as they go and just trying to interrefine it as much as possible. Um, I guess the difference, I mean, we, we've got nine out of 12 teams have qualified. I mean, one of our big challenges right now is, is how we qualify the remaining three. Um, and that needs to happen before the game starts uh, as well. But yeah, lots of learning cross codes. Certainly, you know, those three sports that, that I referred to that all have events in New Zealand are all talking very, very regularly about how we can we can make sure that we get the right environment in place for teams um, uh, when they do come in, in quarantine. Oh, I love it. I love it. Look, all I know is I'm looking for that one message that says, Media uh, media passes are ready to be ex – media accreditation is ready to be uh, accepted. My name is going to be number probably like 1,000 because, you know, you guys got time zone on me. But I will be in that top, top 100 because this was this was said. I, I'm trying to get it to consistency. I got the Olympics. I got the first Rugby World Cup. I needed an excuse to come to New Zealand. I don't want you guys to take away this excuse. This is it's set the yeah. whole year. I, I, I mean, not you guys, but – I don't so want are you going to bike there, Gift? Hey, hey. Right, look, you know, we do what we got to do, all right? Get the legs nice and strong. <laughs> <laughs> bike oh. across the water, yeah. <laughs> oh, Katie, yo, thank you so much. This is, ah, this has been great. And I've learned so much. And I, like I said, we're going to do this again, even if it's afterwards or even if it's during yeah. the Women's Rugby World Cup. Yeah, um, that's great. Yeah. What, I always like to ask, you know, what is the best way that people can learn more about what it is that you're doing with women's rugby and and how they can be able to contribute in the, in their own way? Yeah, so we've got, you know, as part of the, the World Rugby website, we have a, a, a web page, um, www.woman.rugby. If you go on there, you can join into, we have a monthly newsletter that comes out, which profiles... Um, amazing things that are happening globally and we've also we always have a call out for stories like I think one of the really that I was just thinking I was looking at the last story that came out of you know obviously we tried profiling your coaches and your leaders all the time but there was a great story about um, the development camp that happened in in the Caymans um, where they had uh, you know a huge kind of 
push for 100 girls age 8 to 14 with Mercedes Foy leading it. So we're always interested in those great <laughs> stories that come out of a of, of region. So what your coaches are doing, what's happening at a community level, we've got to kind of send us your information and then we spit it out to the world because we, we're really into oh. sharing and transferring knowledge. So if you know of something that's happening that you think um, A, would benefit from a bit of a profile push from a global perspective, but also um, that would benefit from other countries actually sharing in the knowledge that's going on, then you send it our way because um, we love stories from um, everywhere. I love it. I love it. And look, I, I got I got I got some that I, I can throw out there just uh, off bat. So uh, at least now I know because I didn't know that before. So now I know. Yeah, so you, go on that website it. and it says <laughs> send it to it woman dot rugby. I mean, it's in the, it's in there. But join join the current newsletter and send us your stories, and then we'll get someone to come and talk to you. I love it. I love it. Katie, thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> Katie, <laughs> yo, I want to thank you so much. That was the absolute best. The absolute best. I can't wait to have you come through again. Uh, and just like any guest, yo, don't even miss who we even had before. We've had consistently great guests. Last week we had uh, Adam Milby, the president for the Philippines Rugby Union. Uh, we had, uh, uh, before that, we had Warren uh, Mullis and Preston Thompson of the American Rugby Pod. Before that, Toes on Tutitanwe of Viral Rugby. You guys can check out some other greats. Tiffany Faye, 2017 captain for the USA Rugby Team for the Rugby World Cup. We got Tiara Mack, the Miggity Mack, uh, Rhode Island State Senator and... Uh, Rugby player Coma Gandy Fishbin, congratulations to her and her new baby as she is on the USA Rugby Council. Uh, Georgie Coda of of Rugby and Beauty, Kimani Davis of Roots and Maid. We have uh, Naya Tapper and Chetta Emba of USA Rugby who are also now over at Madrid Sevens. Guys, we have had some amazing guests. Phil Thiel, former USA Rugby Eagle. Guys, it, it is, this is, we're just trying to get you all the information, trying to make sure you know how to tap into the opportunity. And of course, want to make sure that you're connecting, all right? This social network doesn't help unless you're able to have a means of feeling like you're connected in and getting to know the people and the players in the game. So definitely check these guys out. And of course, please, please don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to like us on uh, Instagram, Grow Rugby Show. And guys you guys are gonna love this all the way through i want to thank you again for paying attention for watching this for listening and please don't forget i hope you're happy i hope you're healthy and i hope you know that you're highly favored I'll see you next week cheers